Chapter 20 No, Hooter screamed. Gustav, Gustav, he cried, sinking to the ground. The rebels stood staring with puzzled looks. They raised their muskets. So we're dealing with some Tory spies, are we? A ragged soldier said, pointing his gun at Hooter. No, we're patriots, Matt cried out. But the rebels looked on warily as Hooter knelt crying beside Gustav. If you're patriots, what are you doing with the likes of this scum? A soldier asked, motioning to the slain Hessian. We were his prisoners, Matt tried to explain. He captured us in the woods back there, and my little sister walked out into the river and almost fell through the ice. He, he saved her life, and we were just grateful, that's all. We're patriots, really, we are. Patriots grateful to the enemy? What double talk would this be, the corporal muttered. Sounds like Tory double talk to me, another rebel, rebel replied. He began to frisk the boys, digging into their pockets, but stopped when he came to a crumpled dollar bill in Tony's pocket. He handed it to one of the other rebels, and the soldiers gathered around to inspect it. Look, it's got a picture of the general on it, the skinny corporal said, turning the bill over. The United States of America, he read. But it be a strange color paper. The private frowned. And not like any continental currency I've ever seen. Matt shut his eyes tightly. What would the men do if they noticed the date on the bill? It could be false currency that the Redcoats provide their spies, in the event they're captured, another soldier suggested. Yes, that's likely, the corporal replied. We'll just leave it to the captain to decide. He should be bringing down the regiment by now. We're not spies, I tell you. We're not, Matt tried once more to explain. Save your breath, the dirty-looking soldier said, pointing his musket at Matt's heart. It's up to the captain to decide, and if he decides that you're runners, you'll probably rot the rest of your days in jail, along with the other turncoats. But, but we're only kids. My sister is only seven years old. There's no one to look after her, Matt said, pulling Katie to him. The two little ones will be given homes. Good patriot homes, the soldier told him, looking at Katie and then Tony. It was the first time in his life that Tony was actually glad to be so small. He brought his thumb up to his mouth and began to suck on it, just in case he didn't look young enough. He took it out, though, on seeing Matt frown in his direction. Don't worry, the corporal said. The little ones will be raised by patriots. Free patriots. But Matt was worried. They had come so close to finding their way back home. Now they were suddenly closer to spending the rest of their lives shut up in some prison. The hardest part for Matt to swallow was that it wasn't the enemy who was responsible. He and the rest of the club stood watching as one of the rebel soldiers roughly pulled off Gustav's tall black hat and put it on his own head. The other men laughed and hooted as the soldier pranced around with the hat tilted on his head and a smirk on his face. Matt suddenly felt sick to his stomach. He hated to see them acting so badly, for these were his rebels. They were the special brave men that he had always dreamed about, and suddenly they seemed neither special nor brave. Matt looked away, unable to watch any more, as the soldiers laughed and made fun of the dead man. It was as if Gustav had never been a person. Matt turned his head, and he suddenly noticed that one of the soldiers who was watching the spectacle had a small leather pouch tied to his belt. As Matt looked on, he saw the soldier untie the little leather bag and empty it out into his hand. I wager you'd get a smile from your wife if you'd be bringing home these, the soldier said to a stout corporal standing beside him. Matt's mouth dropped when he saw the handful of blue beads. I found them in the snow on the march back, the soldier answered, and for a small price, the little beauties are yours. Matt was about to call to him when the soldier holding the beads suddenly looked up. Here's the regiment now, he said, nodding towards the woods. Matt and the others turned to see a larger group of soldiers making their way to the shore. Matt didn't want to take his eyes off the beads and quickly turned back to watch the soldier drop them back into the pouch and tie it on his belt. Soon the shoreline began to fill up with troops. Matt knew that after their success in Trenton, the rebels must have been feeling victorious, despite the exhausted look on their faces. If only Israel hadn't gotten sick, Matt thought. We would have been walking out of the woods together right now. His eyes filled with tears as he stood watching. What do we have here? A familiar voice suddenly boomed. Matt wiped the tears from his eyes in time to see Captain McCallie standing before him. Runners, Captain. Look like runners to me, anyway, one of the soldiers replied. Found them with this Hessian, he said, pointing to Gustav's body. Um. The captain looked over the trembling members of the Adventure Club and suddenly focused on Matt. Captain, it's me, Matt sputtered. Remember, I was bringing the general his cape? A look of vague recognition came over the captain's face. He turned to spit in the snow, just as General Washington walked up behind him. His spittle landed inches from the general's boot. "'Your Excellency, I beg your pardon, sir. I didn't see you approaching,' the captain stammered. "'It's of little concern,' the general said. He walked over to Matt. "'So it was you who was responsible for returning my cloak?' he asked. Matt was awestruck. He didn't know what to say. 
He didn't even know if he could get any words out. Uh, uh, yes, sir, he managed to croak. It was a bitter night, the general said solemnly, but the morning was as sweet as any I've known. He looked out over the river, his eyelids heavy with lack of sleep. Matt knew he was talking about the victory at Trenton. Suddenly, the general noticed Katie and motioned for her to come to him. "'Well, well, my little lady,' the general whispered as he knelt with Katie on his knee. "'You seem to have gotten your feet wet once again.' Katie nodded and stuck her thumb in her mouth. "'There's a little girl just about your age waiting for me back at Mount Vernon,' he told her. Katie smiled on hearing this. "'And do you know,' the general continued, "'that little girl clucks over me just as much as Mrs. Washington?' "'Yes, and whenever I have to be away from home, "'that little lady insists on my taking an extra pair of stockings.' He winked at Katie as he pulled a pair of woolen socks from his overcoat pocket and gave them to her. Then he put her down and motioned for Matt to come forward. He held out his large hand for Matt to shake. I thank you, sir, for the return of my cloak. It was no night to be without it, and if I can ever be of service to you, please call on me, the general said. No, sir, er, yes, sir, er, I mean thank you, sir, Matt stammered. Then he had an idea. Er, general, sir, if it wouldn't be too much to ask... "'Could I speak to you alone for a minute?' "'The general seemed preoccupied as he stood watching the troops file down to the shore. "'His eyes were red and teary, and his face looked haggard with exhaustion. "'Yet the exhilaration of victory seemed to give him renewed energy. "'He still had much to oversee. "'A minute is all I have time for,' the general said, motioning for Matt to come closer. "'Make haste, lad. What be your concern?' he asked, placing a hand on Matt's shoulder. "'The two of them turned away from the others. "'It took all of Matt's courage to begin.' But once he did, he found that it was easy to talk to the great man. Matt told him all about Israel and Abby and the beads. When he had finished, he looked up to see a grieved look on the general's face. This war has taken so many, the general said in a low voice. My heart is sickened with the sight of it, and yet I find myself called upon to lead them through this misery. The general's voice trailed off, and there was a long silence. Matt didn't know what to say. Finally, the general spoke. Our victory today has brought us that much closer to the peace we all long for and for the freedom we seek. Your friend will not be forgotten. I personally will see that Miss Abigail Gates receives her beads. Do not worry. Then he turned and walked over to his aide, who had been waiting for him. Matt watched as the aide approached the soldier with the beads. After a few words to him, the soldier handed over the pouch. Matt backed away, glaring at the other soldiers who had been ready to throw him in prison but the soldiers were too embarrassed to meet his gaze. Soon the shoreline was bustling with activity as the victorious but exhausted troops poured in, ready to be ferried back across the river. The club members watched as a group of Hessian prisoners were being led to the shore. Captain McCallie came up beside them. The general has ordered your return passage across the river, he said. You're to wait here until a boat is available. Now, mind you, you're under my charge until you leave the shore, so don't be wandering off now. Without another word, he turned and disappeared back into the crowd of soldiers. Let's find a place we can sit down, Matt said, walking over to a big log. The rest of the club members turned and followed him, all except Hooter, who had gone back to Gustav's body. Matt walked over to him and placed his hand on Hooter's shoulder. shoulder. He was good, you know, Matt, Hooter's voice had broken into a sob. I don't care what they say. He was good. Yeah, who? I know, Matt whispered. I don't understand it, Hooter said, looking up to Matt. Who are the good guys and who are the bad guys? It's not like on TV, where you can always tell. No, it's not, Matt said softly. I thought this was supposed to be one of the good wars. The rebels were supposed to be the good guys. But maybe there's no such thing as just good guys fighting bad guys. It seems like there's good and bad on both sides. And you know, the funny thing is that sometimes they're really fighting for the same things. My friend Israel... I don't think he was all that different from Gustav, except for the uniform. Maybe if it weren't for the different uniforms, they could have been friends instead of ending up like this. Both boys stood staring down at the fallen soldier. Gustav was lying on his stomach, with half his face in the snow, and the other half turned toward them. The one eye that they could see was opened. As Matt knelt down beside him and looked into that clear blue eye, he knew he would never forget its unblinking stare the cold, unyielding stare of death. He thought about how warm and full of life Gustav's eyes had been just minutes earlier, and he thought, thought of Gustav's good-natured voice laughing. Das Katie? Ja, 
dust, Katie. Matt felt the tears running down his face as his trembling fingers touched the frozen snow crystals that were forming on the dead soldier's eyelashes. I'm sorry, he whispered. I'm sorry that I didn't thank you for saving my sister's life. I hate war, Hooter cried, his, hus his husky voice choked with pain. Me too, Hoot, Matt whispered, closing Gustav's eyes. Me too. Chapter 21 When Matt and Hooter returned to the group, they found that Katie was missing once again. Katie, where are you? Matt yelled as he frantically scanned the shoreline. Hooter, Tony, and Q joined in the hunt. There she is, Tony said, finally spotting her in some bushes. Katie was sitting on a log and had slipped her little hands into the huge wool socks that the general had given her. She waved a floppy sock at them and grinned. Don't you dare move, Matt called. Stay right where I can see you and don't take another step. He sat down on a big smooth rock facing her while the rest of the boys sat down beside him. Of course, Katie couldn't resist disobeying orders. She promptly spang sprang up and took a big step, then sat back down on the log. I know something that you don't, matty -o, she sang. Not now, Katie, Matt said sternly. You sit right there while we figure out what to do next. What are our choices, matty -o, Tony said in a defeated voice. I don't see how we're ever going to get back home. I know something that, Katie taunted. Katie, will you just sit down and keep quiet so we can think, Matt snapped. He stood up and looked out over the ice-choked river. Good old Rumson, Hooter sighed. I never thought I'd miss it so much. I didn't even miss it that much when I went all the way to California to visit my grandmother. But Hooter, we're not just miles away, Tony said. We're light years away. He bit down on his lip, trying not to cry. I wonder if we'll ever get back, he whispered. They were all suddenly quiet as, this, as they sat, attempting to dispel their fears. Matt was trying hard not to give in to the anxiety that was overtaking him. Katie, meanwhile, was busy taking the socks off her hands. She bent down and untied her sneakers. Katie, what are you doing now? Matt asked as he watched her pull off the sneakers. I'm going to put these socks on my feet, she told him. Katie, are you crazy? Q cried suddenly when he saw what she was doing. No, Katie answered. His socks. Don't you realize that those are George Washington's socks? You can't put them on your feet. Q was horrified. But my feet are cold, Katie told him, slipping her little foot into one of the large socks. And he gave them to me. Besides, my jeans are all wet, and this sock is so big it goes all the way up my leg, she grinned. You can have my socks. We'll trade, Q offered. Oh, no, Katie said. He gave them to me, and I don't have to trade if I don't want to. What a waste, Q sighed, looking over to Matt. George Washington's socks wasted on a girl. Don't take it so hard, Q, Matt tried to console him. You can always try dumping yourself in the river, Tony told him. The general might be out of his socks, but who knows? Maybe he would give you his underwear. Everyone laughed but Q. If I was lucky enough to end up with George Washington's underwear, you can bet I wouldn't wear them either, Q told them. What would you do with them, Hooter wanted to know. I'd frame them, Q said solemnly. Are we going to stand around all day talking about George Washington's underwear, or are we going to try and find the boat, Matt asked impatiently. Everyone grew quiet as they looked back out at the swollen river. I know something that you don't, Katie called again. All right, Katie, Matt snapped. What do you know? I'm not telling now, Katie sulked. She always did this when Matt was impatient with her. Oh, cut it out, Katie, Matt sighed, looking toward the river, searching for the boat. That river is so big, Tony moaned. There's no telling where it may have ended up. Over here, Katie said softly as the boys continued to ignore her. Maybe we could ask some of the soldiers who are steering the boats if they've seen it, Q suggested. But you can ask me, Katie said. I've seen it. Everyone stopped talking and looked at her. You've seen what, Matt asked. The rowboat, Katie smiled. I've seen the rowboat. Where, Matt demanded. Right there, Katie said, pointing to the bushes behind her. Matt and the others bolted from the rock they were sitting on and dove into the bushes. There they found the old rowboat, hidden in the weeds. It's here, Hooter yelled. It's really here. Katie, what would we do without you, Matt cried as he lifted her in his arms and swung her around. Does this mean that I'm a club person now, Katie asked, blushing with pleasure? A club member, Pat, Matt corrected her. Katie, you are definitely a club member. We're going to make you associate vice president, he grinned. Look at this, cried Q, who was standing alongside the boat. Matt and the others huddled beside Q as he pointed to a puddle of water that had formed on the floor of the boat. In the reflection of the water, they could read backward the chipped letters, 
Emmett Lavart that were carved on the inside of the craft. Time travel, Matt read the letters aloud. Emmett Lavart spelled backwards is time travel. Everyone began talking and laughing at once. Everyone except Q, who had suddenly stepped back from the boat. He stood nervously, adjusting his glasses. There's something wrong with the boat, he said as loud as he could. Everyone suddenly grew quiet. Don't you remember how we all fell under its spell as soon as we saw it? How it sort of pulled us in? Q's right, Hooter said. We don't feel as if we're under its power now. Feelings of panic began to overcome him. Do you think that maybe the power has all worn off? Tony asked nervously. There's got to be a way to activate this thing, Q said. I can't believe it, Hooter sighed. I can't believe that we're stuck here in the 18th century. I'm not sticking anywhere, Katie said. And without another word, she climbed into the boat. I'm ready to leave, she announced. Everyone watched as she settled herself down between the two seats and waited with her thumb in her mouth. Oh no, Tony moaned. It's starting to snow again. Matt and the boys stood shivering and wondering what to do. Katie took her thumb out of her mouth. I want to go home, she complained. It's too cold. I want to be where it's warm. And with those words, the old rowboat suddenly began to tremble. What's happening, Tony squeaked. Quick, quick, Q called. Everyone climb in. Tony Hooter and Matt followed Q, falling over one another as they scrambled into the boat. Matt sat down on a seat next to Hooter as the old boat began to rattle and shake and then spin around among the weeds and the bushes. Where are we going, Matt called above the loud rush of air that had encircled them. I don't know, Q called back, but I wouldn't be surprised if it was someplace warm. And then they were gone, vanished boat and all. General, General, cried Captain McCrowley as he went wildly running down the shore. General Washington was standing next to a boat about to depart. Yes, Captain, what is it? The general asked. The children, General, it's the children, Captain McCrowley exclaimed. They've disappeared into thin air. I saw them myself. They were in a boat on the beach, and suddenly they started to spin around, and then they vanished. As Jehovah is my witness, the captain wheezed. General Washington frowned, on surveying the captain's unruly appearance and smelling his harsh whiskey breath. It's not time for celebrating yet, captain, he said sternly. No, general, you don't understand. I really saw. But the captain was guided away from the commander by several of the general's aides. George Washington shook his head. The victory at Trenton had been long in coming, and the general knew his men deserved to celebrate, but he hated to see his officers acting so badly. He wished they behave in a more professional manner. They should be setting examples for the other men, and drink had no place in the military as far as the general was concerned. General Washington turned and was about to step into the boat when he tripped and fell. "'Sir, are you hurt?' an officer interrupted, helping his superior to his feet. "'No, no, I'm fine, except for the soaking,' the general said on standing." The water had gotten into his boots, and he could suddenly feel the wet socks sticking to his feet. He automatically reached into his overcoat pocket for his extra pair of socks. Then he smiled on remembering the little feet that were in them now. I hope she's warm enough, the general thought, stepping into the boat. He didn't have, he needn't have worried. She was. As the members of the adventure club found themselves spinning through space in a cloud of darkness, they could feel the temperature rising. When the boat finally settled and the mist lifted, Matt opened his eyes but there was not enough light to see. Katie, Matt called into the darkness. Maddie-o, Katie called back. Are you okay, Matt asked, reaching for her. I'm okay, Katie answered. Hooter, he called. Are you okay? Yeah, Maddie-o, I'm okay, Hooter whispered. Tony, how about you? Still with us, Matt called. Yeah, Matt, I'm here. Wherever here is, Tony called back. Q, are you all right, Matt asked. I'm okay, Matt, Q replied. An eerie silence followed. Matt, Katie called. Do you think we're home? I don't know, Katie Matt whispered, but I know we're not on the Delaware River anymore, he said, dipping his hand into the warm, still water.